gets quiet. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you all so much for coming and being part of our 25th anniversary celebration. We hope you've had a great time. And it's certainly been our honor to, to host you and welcome you. And um, we, uh, I guess, uh, express our thoughts and prayers to the folks that uh, were here and thought they needed to go back to Florida and the coastline of Georgia and South Carolina and North Carolina. I don't know if they've kind of finalized exactly where the hurricane might hit just yet. I hadn't followed that this morning, but there's uh, several folks uh, we know are going to be impacted somewhere, so let's all kind of remember them in our thoughts and prayers. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started uh, with everything you want to know about the 2020 and tag you up. So tag Dr. Chief Engineer Corvette. take these spots down a little bit. We show our videos and want to make sure everybody can see them nice and clear. Anyway, um, I can hardly see you guys. Uh, thanks for coming out. This is the smallest crowd we've had this weekend. I'm curious how many of you have been to one of our other presentations? Oh my God. <laughs> how many of you have been to both of them? <laughs> You're really expecting us to screw up and show you something. You're not supposed to see, aren't you? <laughs> Anyway, I uh, appreciate you hanging in, in with us. Uh, we do try to mix it up a little bit every day, and so uh, we got a, little, a few little different things, but I wanna make sure, you've probably been thinking of other questions, so I wanna make sure we have time for Q&A, because we do have a hard stop at the end of this, and it seems like we run over every single time with all the uh, questions and interests around the car. So, let's get started. <clears throat> We'll start with the same video, so some, for some of you this is three times. And can we take these bright lights down a little bit so we can see the screen? All right. There we go. Very nice. Less light, more noise. That's what we want. So the first one, we showed you this. It said GM Confidential, and that's because the video was created a long time ago for an internal use. Um, showed it around a bunch of internal audiences and we wanted to give some excitement around the car that was coming. It was still years away when we put this together, but we wanted people to be able to appreciate a little bit of our history and where we were taking Corvette into the future. That's why it says GM Confidential.
setting all Corvettes are performance cars that different is to the degree. He could be talking about today's car the same way. We have performance cars, everything from Stingray to ZR1. Um, Zora deserves all the credit uh, that he gets. Uh, we're making him super famous now. But uh, you see him driving those cars, the Serve 1, Serve 2, those are scary cars to drive. You can see they have no, you know, barely even a windshield, never mind any roll protection, anything. They were a handful to drive at low speed, and you see him driving on that bank track. He drove on our circle track way back when. That track was designed for a top speed of 150 miles an hour. He drove that crude car over 200 miles an hour on that track. He was nuts. <laughs> Very brave, you know, he's a race car driver, and so um, I've driven that sort of two just a teeny bit. I just cannot believe uh, how brave those guys were. Just incredible. So, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna change it up just a little bit. Uh, I wanted to uh, make sure that uh, I thanked everybody for being here for the 25th anniversary of the museum. It certainly worked out great uh, having the new car available to show you. And we have uh, quite a number of people uh, down here, a lot of people from Michigan. So design it in Michigan, build it in Kentucky, and we sell it and race it all around the world. So here's a bunch of the Michigan team members. And of course, we have a big contingent here in uh, Bowling Green supporting this event. So um, be sure and talk to them while you're here. So um, obviously the big story, new car. Um, we couldn't be prouder to be bringing it out uh, right now. It's a great successor uh, to the prior generations of car and um, we are really, really happy to be here. So last couple times, since most of you guys have been to this and I've talked about the architecture a lot and why we changed the architecture and what are the advantages of it. So um, you can watch that online if you missed it. I'm sure everybody recorded it. Uh, so we're going to change it up a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit more about exterior, interior, and take a little deeper dive into some of the features that we have that we haven't talked about uh, towards the end of the presentation. So I wanted to give uh, Kirk a chance, but I, I, we always show this slide because this kind of sums up the whole thing. Uh, we needed to go mid-engine <coughs> to get the weight on the back for performance both on the street and on the track. The challenge was how do you do that and keep all the things that people love about the fifth, sixth, seventh generation cars. And that was the formula we've been working on for close to 15 years. So Harlan put this together. Dave Hill was here this uh, weekend. Uh, Harlan actually presented a slide that looked virtually like this uh, to Dave Hill back in 2005 uh, to start getting the ball rolling on a serious study around a mid-engine Corvette. So like I said, we're gonna get Kirk up here, talk a little bit uh, about exterior, and then we'll have Brian uh, talk about interior. So Kirk. Okay, thanks, Tadge. <laughs> we had a great uh, induction last night for Tom Peters, and that, uh, I gotta tell you, the, the gang that showed up, um, just to give you a little bit of court hi Corvette history here, we had Kip Wasenko, who designed the two-rotor Corvette. We had Randy Mateen, who was working on C3 Corvettes, uh, we had Jerry Palmer there, which I think he started on the 67, 68, and, that, uh, and then John Caffaro, and uh, you know, picked up all that span in between Jerry Palmer to, to Tom Peters, and Tom had the last 20 years. So it was great to see all those guys. A lot of history, just right there in those individuals. Um, you can see some of the guys here, and that, uh, you know, the lower slides kind of were out there with John, and. Um, of course, he's given us the look because we have the car sitting about 50 mils too high. And that, uh, these, these are, it's a steel buck with a foam covered um, a wooden box on it. They have electric motors in it, but sometimes they don't always function for us uh, in the colder months and that. So we're, uh, that's why we're all kind of quiet right here because we're, we're getting a, a lesson. So, but upper slide, you'll see Taj and company. And uh, you know, we have a lot of dialogue with as you can appreciate, senior leadership is involved with this car and uh, definitely shares her thoughts with us and that there's a lot of open communication in, in with them. And these are some of the some of the pictures of, you know, we, we worked through the clay and I think I showed you some of the developmental uh, designs, but this is really where we started to hone in on what you're seeing as the, the new Stingray and that. Uh, 
this uh, this shot we took, um, you know, this really told us what the how much the proportion can really leverage uh, the new look of a car, and, uh, and you know, this is the biggest step we've ever taken with Corvette as far as a proportional change. It's, and you can see it's very impactful here. You know, comparing it to a Z06, you see a Z06 on the, on the street today, and it's a, it's a rock star uh, to see her drive. Uh, but you can see this, this new car just eclipses it, and, and it's, it looks to be like 20 years newer. Hey, Kurt, can I chime in on that slide just a little bit? People sure. are probably wondering what this bus is doing <laughs> back here. You know, here's a place where we're showing advanced product, and why is it something that looks like an old motor home kind of lurking in the background? That's actually a uh, converted viewing uh, vehicle. So we do this work in Michigan, and sometimes it's 20 below, and sometimes it's snowing. And here you want to look at a car outside. So uh, how do you do that in the winter? How do you get a group of, you know, a bunch of softies out there? Uh, wanting to look at the car, so they actually converted one. They put glass panels. You can't really see it very here, well here, but it's the whole side of the vehicle is glass, and so you can park the cars outside, and everybody can sit uh, warm and cozy in that thing, and they they drive it around. So you can see from all different angles. So um, life is different in design. It's, it's very very nice. Well, well to add, add to that, we. We're in the bus with the senior leadership, but of course, we're out there in adverse weather and we're making changes. So as you can appreciate, usually the youngest designer that's on the on the bus, he it's his his or her job to run out there, take a new line, pin a mock-up, and then run back in. So there's a little seniority involved. <laughs> uh, a lot of good dialogue. We talked with the folks yesterday about aerodynamics on the new Stingray. You know, we started off in a scale model. Uh, that's that's really good for us because, as you can appreciate, we can make fast changes on this on this model. We'll in just hand modeling. Typically, we would do uh, in an eight-hour shift. We'd probably get 20 to 24 changes in just hand modeling the proportion there. So, so it's quick. It's still you know we have people asking about digital tools. Well, the, the hands-on is still you know with our sculpting capability and the, uh, the level of expertise they have, we can still move very fast it, with clay. No. And, and Kurt, I just wanted to add that that, sc that scale model, that 40% is here at the museum. We just yes. brought it here for you guys to see. Thanks, Harlan. Um, when we aren't in scale, we're doing CFD, computational flow dynamics. This is basically computer simulations, and that we're able to uh, pick the strands. You see those colored lines? up there, well, as you know, the computer will run, you know, probably a thousand lines over the car, but we're more interested in certain areas uh, for study, so that's why you'll see, like, this is, this is highlighted. Uh, we spent a lot of time on that front corner. It has to gather up air, but it also has to keep the air attached to go down the body side, and then, and then, you know, it's got to get diverted into the rear compartment of it, so a lot of time spent tuning that, I would say. Probably if no less than 35 changes on that front corner you know, to get it to do all that. And then we'll come back with CFD. And we like doing using the pressure maps that you see here. Uh, you'll notice that uh, Heritage talked about the base of windshield, how uh, with it being further forward or actually picking up downforce in the base of windshield. And then also uh, the Z51 rear spoiler. You can see there in the red area how much how much downforce we're getting. And as I was telling people, the the rear spoiler is really a hybrid. It's uh, it's spoiler in the middle, but it's a wing in the outer corners. And what that gives us is we're using the wing section. It still gives you downforce, but it gives you lower drag. So it's 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 part of that tuning of the car. And uh, you know our, our our Alex McDonald and those guys will tell you that this car this part's very impactful uh, to its track performance. Then the follow up to that CFD is what you see right now on the right hand slide there. That's actually a full-size clay that we're doing rolling road testing. And when do, you know, the benefit here is that there's stuff that we're doing to the underbody as well. So it's a big tuning tool, but this is really what helps us evaluate the total downforce of the car. The last step would be to, when we get to the track and we have you know, pre-production vehicles, uh, you know, that was, that's kind of our last tuning knob. This is this where you can see the CFD. Like I said, we, we can select the strands. Uh, we can identify the areas of learning. Uh, the left-hand side there is our brake cooling. 
You can see it comes in just uh, either side of the license plate. Um, you know, for the neat thing about this car is for, for any tracking, you don't have to take the plate off the center because we're not taking any air off the center line of car. So it's all, it's all done on either side. And then the next one to the right here, again, talking about the rear spoiler, you can see the air goes underneath, is all over the top. Uh, the front cooler, you know, it's going through uh, a heat exchanger plus a condenser, and then it has to get out, out of the wheel opening uh, to get, to get a, a certain amount of extraction. And then the lower right slide, you can see the body side, it's, there's no accident that that air is falling right into that side scoop in that uh, you can appreciate. We did a lot of iterations with that scoop, up and down, fore and aft, uh, but that became the most optimal position. And now I'm gonna kick it over. I think uh, this is a, you know, we like to, when we get to the end of the program, we, we have a lot of fun with uh, dropping the car into certain backgrounds and that, but this, this gives you a feel of the overall design and you know, some of the inspiration and that we do look at, uh, you know, military aircraft for for surfacing and you know there's there's things that they do with their aerodynamics that even though we're two different vehicles we we still enjoy that aspirational value can i chime in on that last slide kirk and then sure. i'll introduce brian so one of the questions that i've gotten a lot uh since we introduced this car uh and it's so related to design and what kirk does uh people are looking at the shape of this inlet and i had engineers um write me and say, boy, design didn't do you any favors with that sloped opening. Not, not very efficient. Too bad you had to do that. So anyway, I guess these guys got it wrong too. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at the, the angle that that one's at. Um, but there's a ton of functionality uh, around this. And we, sh we could have done just a squared off opening. And they're saying, well, why do you have to go way up into the door like this? And there's a lot going on. So um, you have to have an opening. It has, you think about driving in the rain. So you might not think about that, but you're driving in the rain. And the a engine is actually breathing through the top part of this. And so there's a vacuum, the engine is sucking in the air. And so imagine if we'd laid it back this way, when it's raining, the, the water's coming in and the engine's just breathing that in. So having the shape leaning forward like that creates an umbrella, almost like an awning over that. So the water running down the side of the car actually sheds off. So having it leaning this way, is very important for getting that water out of the way of the breathing engine. Another thing we have to think about is stone throw. So sticky front tires, they toss, you know, they pick stuff up off the road and they throw it up in the air, it bounces around all over the place. You don't want a blunt, forward-facing element right there. Some of you guys know this from the brake cooling duct that we have in today's car. That can get hammered by little pebbles and grit and stuff over time. So having this facing down makes it a glancing blow for any stones coming. And there's actually a little rocker extension here. People probably think, oh, that's just for cool design. It's a little bit of an aero rocker extension, but the biggest thing it does is keep stones under the car. They keep stones from bouncing up and getting into this area. So including the, the door handle in this and hiding that and keeping it clean and giving you a surface where you can open the door without touching the paint. We know you guys, you know, wash your car. You don't want to touch the body color paint. So having a little accent color on there and hiding the handle underneath so you don't have to touch it at all. So all of that thinking goes into that simple design element on the side of the car. So that, that gives you a sense of how we all work together to create a car that both looks good and works really well. Same is true on interior, so I'm gonna have Brian come up and talk about that. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, morning. My name is Brian Steckel. I'm one of the uh, one of the four members on the interior design team for the 2020 Stingray. Um, I talked a little bit more in depth yesterday, so I'm gonna try and uh, be a little bit more brief so we have more time for features uh, with Harlan at the end. but. Um, so this is kind of a, just it gives you an idea of, of where we started. Um, we start every process with sketching, um, both pen and paper and uh, going in digitally. Um, and these are some of the very first sketches from Tristan Murphy, our lead interior designer, um, showing the direction that the car took. You can see the early evolution of the cockpit shapes, you know, forming around on the, on the dashboard and on the door and how that kind of really envelops you as a driver and creates this really special driver cockpit space 
That's one of the things we really wanted to make sure that we delivered for this car was a very exotic, special driving experience. And taking what you're familiar with as a Corvette, it needs to be recognizable as a Corvette, but really elevating it and uh, to the next generation. And then you can see here um, how that kind of, you know, the, the driver cockpit is, or is being evolved even further, a little bit closer to uh, kind of what you'd see on today, and then like a 2LT trim. <clears throat> A couple other things you can see on this slide um, beginning to evolve are the, the square steering wheel. Um, that was really important for us. We have a, a brand new in this car. We have a 12-inch multifunction digital gauge cluster, and then as well as the 8-inch uh, Chevy MyLink display to the right. The square steering wheel was really key to allowing us to, or allowing the driver to be able to see every inch of that, the uh, driver information center, and then also. Uh, with the top being a little bit lower, you get a much better view of the road, get to see the HUD, get your down vision a little bit better so you can see exactly where the front of the car is, you'll be able to place it in the right spot every time. And then the bottom of the steering wheel coming up helps you get in and out much easier, less banging your knees on the wheel, stuff like that. And then the other thing we do once we kind of uh, pick some sketches that we like and we start moving in the direction is we work with a clay modeling team. We have a team of super talented clay sculptors just like the exterior does. And we use clay because we can move it very fast, we can make a lot of changes on the fly, we can uh, you know, model something up, put the, push the seats up against the model, sit in it, see how it feels, make sure that all the kind of assumptions that we're working with in sketches and in math uh, actually feel right. We, can, you know, we work very hard about component placement, making sure you know, we have the our, our ride mode knob here, the transmission controls, make sure, make sure the screen is falling easily to hand. Uh, we really just focused on making sure everything about this driver cockpit space just feels perfect. And then here you can see some shots of the team actually working in the studio. So we have a couple of these big long 20 foot pull down boards so where we can put, uh, we put up sketches. You can see this is actually one of the sketches that we published. So you can see this one on the internet and then you can see the, um, the design team actually sitting in the clay model like I was just talking about here. Checking out how some of the things feel. You know, I'm, I'm checking out the the feeling of the pull grip on the door, making sure that feels like a really nice handshake that the car gives you every time you get in and out. <clears throat> and here you can see Ryan, who's he's also he's the uh, was de design director for the program. He also worked on your C7 if you've got one of those. <clears throat> and then after the clay model, um, we move into a hard model. So where we take and work with the shops and work with engineering. Here's where we really start fine tuning the fit and finish. We're trying to get a really great level of craftsmanship um, and make this the best best Corvette we've ever put together. And so this, is a, this was a part of the, a, a fully wrapped foam model that we made for the um, leadership within both GM Design and the company. So we actually take and make all these parts out of foam and wrap them in leather so it looks almost like a real car. And this is a, a great opportunity for the design team to check and see how everything's fitting together. We can identify early issues that we want to improve upon for the next iteration of the design. So we're going through and you can see most of these parts are either foam or aluminum and we're just kind of checking and see how and everything fits. You can see Ed Welburn and John Cafaro here checking out to see how it looks. What's that? Lower right? <laughs> yeah, this is kind of a candid shot. We're all talking about something. You know, I'm not sure what, but this is, what's that? Uh, uh, I'm not sure, it was a couple years ago now, so. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, we're, we're to go to lunch probably, Harlan says. <laughs> and then this is a great rendering that the team put together here. This just, oops, sorry, this one just keeps auto advancing on me, but this is a great shot. This really tells the whole story for us. Um, it's just a, you know, the, you know, a driver in there in a kind of a racing environment, just showing the whole cockpit, you know, um, how driver focused it is, how exciting it is. You know, we just wanted this experience to be completely enveloping. Um, you know, again, great, great view down the road, every, all the controls, where they want to be. And then this shot here um, is another one. This kind of shows just the breadth of the, the bandwidth that the car can achieve. So where it's very sporty in the red car, right here. And then the next one, um, just shows how much also if you you know when you pick like a 3LT and you get the fully leather interior this is showing the sky cool gray um, with the stitching and, and just how exotic it can feel and how luxurious 
And then lastly, I always end on this slide because you know it's all about the people, it's all about the team. The great thing about Corvette is this phenomenal relationship we have between design and engineering and all the talented people that work on it. Um, sculpt, clay and digital sculptors, the design team, the engineering team, it wouldn't be the fantastic product that it is without the great relationships that we have. So this is a shot of the interior design team um, as well as engineering and sculpting. <clears throat> And then uh, I want to talk to you guys also a little bit more about uh, color and trim. So one of the things that we wanted to do with the 2020 um, is build upon what we had already started with C7, um, with, with the, uh, the Grand Sport, with the, uh, the Rapid Blue, excuse me, and, get, and bring, the, bring to the 2020 a lot more color and trim options and a lot more material options so you can really customize the car any way you like. Um, if you select a 3LT package, you have up to 13 different interiors you can choose from, including the two-tone blue that's shown here. I think these will auto advance through a couple different ones. There we go. So you can see the Sky Cool Gray stitch package. Oop. There's a Sky Cool Gray interior. This is a 3LT, so you can see that the cockpit shapes go Sky Cool Gray, and you get the black stitches. I thought these auto advance, but maybe they don't. <clears throat> There's your adrenaline red. There's a natural. So a lot of people have been asking us about, you know, what's the difference between natural and a natural dip? Here it is. So when you have a natural interior, you have the cockpit shapes in the natural color, and then the rest of the dashboard and console and doors are jet black. And then if you're going natural dip, what we mean with that is every leather surface it's going to go that, with that natural color. So you see the rest of the door, the rest of the console, and the dashboard are all going to be in that natural color. So this is a very nice, very expensive looking option. Um, it looks like a million bucks. And it's, it's unbelievable that we can sell it for the price we sell it for. Um, this is showing the Morello, Morello dip option. On the Morello, you get the um, adrenaline red stitch. And that also looks really nice. And then we have the, the two-tone blue, as I talked about a minute ago. Uh, this is the jet black with the yellow stitch package. Also looks really, really great. And then jet black with the red stitch package. And then you can see the torch red accents on the steering wheel. Um, you can also get the seat belts in up to six different colors. And I believe you can mix and match any color you want. So if you want to have a, jet, uh, an, a torch red car with adrenaline red stitching and yellow belts, you can do that. I don't know why, but you can do it. And then we've also got a lot of different seat options. So one of the things that we heard from our customers um, talking about who bought the C7 is a lot of people would buy the competition seat because they wanted the carbon fiber in the seat back. They wanted to be able to say they checked every box, but then they were finding out that that, com that seat was a little bit too aggressive for them. It was a le little bit less comfortable than they wanted to on long trips. Um, so we created the GT2 seat to be a really nice blend that has the comfort of the, of the base seat, but also has the carbon fiber and uh, gloss black accents of the competition seat. And of course now, so we, now we have the, the base seat, you have your GT2 seat, which is optional on 2LT and standard on 3LT. It's a really nice Napa leather. It's, you can also order suede inserts if you want. And then of course we still do have the competition seat, which is even grippier than today. We have the performance textile fabric to really hold you in place on the bolsters and on the seat, uh, seat cushion. <clears throat> so depending on which trim level seat, you can order the competition in all three trim levels, and then uh, the GT1 is standard on a 1LT and 2LT, and on 2LT you can option the GT2 or competition. And then also for exterior color, uh, we have what, 12 different options. Yeah. <clears throat> a couple new colors for, uh, for this year. Um, we're adding Accelerate Yellow, Rapid Blue, and Zeus Bronze. A lot of people have been asking us about Accelerate Yellow. You'll, hopefully you'll be able to see a couple of those soon. And I'm gonna hand it back to Harlan. He's gonna talk a, bit, a little bit more. So Thanks, let me Brian. jump in here and here. I talked about uh, the this, this side cove uh, on exterior. I'll give you an example of something we do that's kind of unique on the interior. I don't know if we can go back to uh, one of the overall interior shots, but this is a good one. If you look at these switches right here, you see three switches. That's the traction off button, that's the front cameras, 
and the front lift, if you get it. So on most manufacturers, and uh, I don't want to name one, but they're known for charging exorbitant prices for every little thing, and their car looks like a potato, as Harlan says. <laughs> if, you don't, if you buy one of those cars, and you don't put a lot of options on it, what you get is big rows of blank switches. It, it says cheapskate, 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 all the way down for everything you didn't order, and it's thousands of dollars to fill in each one of those little buttons. Even on a fully loaded car, there's still blank switches. <laughs> yeah, and, and the media gets into these cars, and they're always driving loaded cars, so they're saying, oh, the interior's nice. If you get a car that doesn't have everything, it looks really cheap. This looks like a, a, a fleet car, a rental car, with all these blank spaces. Well, here's an example of where some cars, a 1LT, only has traction control off. You go to 2LT, and then you get the front cameras. If you check the front lift system, which we're talking about later, the button goes there. But working with design, what we do is when you get the standard car, you get one button here. So we tool up a unique button that fills that whole space, so no blanks. So we did three different versions, one with one switch, one with two switches, and one with three switches. So it always looks like a complete car. Whether you pay $60,000 or $80,000, it still looks like a really nice, well-filled out car. So thanks for working with interior guys and trying to make that and make it affordable, because uh, that's a, a nice trick to do too. So um, something special we do for you guys. Harlan? Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, talk to you guys about a minute about the, uh, the different trim levels. We didn't really go over this in any of the other presentations. And you hear a lot of us talking about, like Tan just talked about, 1LT, 2LT, and 3LT. So how many people uh, sat in the uh, black car outside? So that's a 1LT car. And uh, a lot of people are amazed, you know, what we get, you know, for 59,995, including destination. Um, so you do get uh, things like a 10 speaker Bose audio system. You get the 12 inch screen and the eight inch screens with Apple CarPlay, Android Autos, all standard, leather seats, all standard, uh, eight way power. Power tilt and telescoping wheel is standard. Rear park assist is standard, uh, which we never, haven't had before, as well as the rear vision camera. You get the central locking, AM, FM, XM. Uh, so the car, the standard car 1LT, of course, and you get the LT2 V8 and the dual clutch transmission, and all that comes with that, and, and the uh, 19s and 20 wheels and all that. So you saw that car. I just want to point out that the standard car has a lot of standard features. So you say, well, what do I get if I up to the 2LT, if I move up there? So we, get, we added a lot of, um, if you're familiar with Corvette, we have a lot of the things that you're used to with 2LT, but a lot new that we've added that we haven't had before. So some of the new features uh, that are now included in 2LT are, first of all, the Performance Series Bose Audio with 14 speakers. We talked about that yesterday. 640 watt system, very powerful. So the standard system is equivalent probably to the up level system we had previously, and the new system is way above, way beyond that. Uh, then we all, it also comes with the navigation, with the now features uh, real time traffic, and it also comes with performance data recorder, which we have upgraded, so you can now, um, excuse me, you can now program it as a dash cam, so it automatically starts every time you start the car, and you can also uh, record both circuit tracks and autocross point-to-point -point tracks as well. It also has val valet mode. We've added, um, also added to that, you can get the power, um, I'm sorry, the memory package has now been expanded to have both driver and passenger side. And you're saying, why do we need it on the passenger side? Well, I think a lot of you are couples here, and how many people have had the passenger get in and say, who touched my seat? Who's been sitting here? Are you cheating on me? Who's been in the seat? So, 
So you say, push the button, just push the button. You're my number one, push number one. That's you. <laughs> she's laughing, my wife's here, she's laughing. So, uh, it's a great feature. Also on a road trip, you know, if you switch, driver and passenger, you switch back and forth. You can switch, you know, to your seats back and forth, or your different heights or sizes. It really is a nice thing to have. Powerful mirrors, a lot of people are excited about that. It's now part of 2LT, and you can set it, you can either just push the button to power fold them, or you can set it so that every time you lock the car, it'll automatically fold them as well. And then we added a lot of features that you guys have asked for, um, things like blind, side blind zone alert and rear cross traffic as well. So those are, those are new safety alerts that are included with the 2LT. Another new thing that we're all excited about, those of us who have driven the car, we think people are really going to appreciate, is the rear camera mirror. So how this works is your rear uh, view camera, I'm sorry, your rear view mirror, you flip it and it turns into a video camera. So you can see out the rear, no blind spots, it's very high res, and you can also adjust it up and down or zoom it to whatever preference you like. A lot of us like to see a little bit of the rear, and that's what you see on the roof, the roof-mounted camera. That's how you tell a 2LT a two and up as well. Also, um, we, we still have the front curb view cameras. Uh, again, good for seeing the, uh, the front of the car, but the difference is, Cash was talking about it, we added a button. You used to have to go in and find it on the touch screen. Now it has its own dedicated button, so it's very easy to turn that on uh, when, you need it, uh, when you need it as well. Another new feature, wireless phone charging. That's the little pocket that's between the seats. A lot of people were asking about what that's for. Nice place to put your phone. Also, if you have that wireless charging, and, well, on the, and most of the new uh, phones are getting that, it's, you just put it there and it'll, and it'll um, charge it up for you. Head-up display, we have a new full-color head-up display. It's also a big part of 2LT. So there's a lot of features on 2LT. It also opens up the natural color uh, interior, and it also opens up the option for the GT2 seat. Now, all three cheap trim levels are available with competition sport seats. On the 1LT, though, we did something a little different. We figured this is like, somebody gets a 1LT in competition, that's like the track car. You guys are hardcore. I don't want any of these options. I want to have it. So we, we, we did a performance textile version of the competition seat. On the others, um, 2LT and up, you get the lumbar adjust, you get the wing adjust, you get heated and ventilated on all the seats. So 2LT, you can actually get all three, is the one that you can get all three options, GT1, GT2, and competition. So the 3LT is our ultimate. That's our ultimate Corvette uh, interior. It, it, it comes standard with the GT2, so it upgrades you there, and it has a full leather-wrapped interior. Both the instrument panel and the doors, upper and lower, which is new this time, the whole thing is wrapped in leather, and it's all uh, Napa, Napa leather. The other thing, the upper part of the interior is all suede, is all suede and is also color keyed to the interior. So the gray, the natural, they have a lighter color upper uh, part of the interior. And then we have the exclusive colors that Brian was going over, like the two-tone blue and the Morello and the natural dipped are exclusive to the 3LT. So that's kind of your ultimate package there. So I hope that, just trying to shed some light on the three, uh, three packages we have. And we actually have, um, there's a silver car with gray seats that represents the 2LT, if you sat in that one with the gray two-tone. And then we have the, both the torch red and the other silver car with the two-tone blue interior, our 3LT. So you can go, if you want to see the difference, go back when we're done and check the three different trim levels out for yourself. Architecture. <laughs> Thanks, Harlan. Harlan has been such a trooper over the last week. Uh, you guys know we've been on the road uh, last week and a half with Carlisle. Last weekend, Harlan probably talked to every single one of the 60,000 people uh, that came there and another 8,000 or so, I think, uh, here this weekend. So uh, he hasn't been feeling all that well, but he's powering through. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity to get out and talk about this car. So thank you, Harlan. So, um, Somebody want to clap for him? So
So let me run through this. We, we've done, this is our third presentation. We haven't really even talked about the architecture, the basic structure of the car, the foundation. We've talked about the kind of the change of the weight distribution and everything and how that helps us. But designing the foundation of the car, if you look at the rolling chassis out there, you can see some of the guts, which to engineers is really the beautiful part, the part that's underneath. And um, we learned how to do aluminum structures pretty well on the seventh generation, and we took everything we learned and made it even better on the eighth generation. Uh, the new car is fabricated in an entirely new body shop in Bowling Green. So if you go over there, you'll see the whole C7 body shop and a whole C8 body shop uh, kind of side by side. So it was a big investment for us uh, to create a unique in the world, mid-engine, good uh, luggage room, open air architecture. That's a solution that we've been working on for a long time, making all those things happen. And it required a lot of new technology. If you look at uh, the construction of this thing, you'll see that there's um, what we call high pressure die castings. There's six gigantic castings. Uh, they're about four feet long and they make up the most complicated parts uh, of the structure. So if you look at uh, every place you see where there's ribs and things, so this whole corner all the way down here, that's one casting on both sides. And the same thing from here all the way up through the shock towers all the way back here is also a high pressure die casting. Then there's cradles underneath, you can't see the one on the back, that also have these massive high pressure die castings. We use that because high pressure die casting is the best way to form aluminum in the world. You power the aluminum into the mold and so you don't get porosity, you get really good material properties and you can cast parts with very thin walls and do very thin ribs which is very mass efficient. You take all these complicated interfaces and you can put them all in one part uh, and that's a real winner. Not having all those joints is a real win for body structure integrity. When we went to go find a company to make this, because General Motors doesn't do a ton of casting, especially high pressure die casting, we found there was nobody in the world willing to do this size, this quantity, and this quality of casting uh, for Corvettes. There just wasn't anybody. And so we had to do it ourselves. We had to go back to General Motors leadership and say, we got to learn how to do this. And so we actually went back and appropriated, did a business case for it, went back and appropriated money and built out our Bedford, Indiana plant, put in a new assembly area. Uh, it's a plant where they've cast blocks and heads. It's not the exact same kind of process, but at least they're somewhat familiar with casting. So we actually brought this, we insourced this uh, so that we could build the volume we wanted of this kind of technology. And it's a huge enabler to make this whole body structure work. So it's amazing we've gotten this far. We really haven't talked about the engine <laughs> very much. I'm amazed that uh, we got away with it. Um, so uh, you know, you know, it's the, the headlines: 495 horsepower, 470 foot-pounds of torque, zero to 60 under three seconds, top speed 194 miles an hour. So um, I, I said it at the reveal uh, at a time when the whole rest of the world is going to small displacement charged engines, um, we're bucking the trend and staying with the, the small, black, small block V8. It's a huge competitive advantage for us. It's a very compact engine. It's very light for the power it puts out. Having that engine compactness helped us with the body structure because we could make load pass around the engine um, and having it small made those very, very efficient. So um, the architecture of, in return, helped out the engine. So. Um, putting the engine in the back makes the breathing uh, a lot more effective. So when the engine's in the front, it, the throttle's on the front and it has to breathe cool air and you have this big radiator forward of it that goes right up to the hood and so that's why you see these uh, snorkel arrangements we've had that either get really thin and wide, reach over the top of the radiator or on C7, you take a turn and you go out to the behind the headlamp and it's a very compressed space up there, and so it's very difficult to get low restriction intake systems. The same thing on the exhaust. When the engine is in the front, you take the exhaust out the manifold, and it has to get down to the center tunnel, and there's a pinch point because we've got the engine shoved rearward as far as we can, right up against the front of dash, 
and then trying to snake exhaust through where your pedal box is, the throttle and everything, and you gotta get into the tunnel, there's a pinch point there between the block and the body structure and where the passengers need to be, and you actually have to compress the exhaust, you dent the pipes, and it's a very restrictive uh, area in the car. When you put the engine in the back, if you've seen the engine out there, we've got these like really cool header, short headers that come out over the top and they can go down under the luggage car and there's no pinch point. And so both on the intake side and the exhaust side, we have very low restriction on this. So we're able to take advantage of that with the cam timing uh, to get a very free breathing engine that pulls very hard all the way to red line. Uh, puts the power peak up at 495 uh, horsepower. So that's a way that the car's architecture helps the engine guys perform better. So uh, we also have a DCT. I don't remember, do I have something on the DCT? No, okay, but I, will. I do want to talk about this. We haven't talked about this much. You'll see some of the cars out there, uh, you know, we go to Corvette shows uh, all over and we know how much People like to customize their car. A lot of the hoods are up at, at shows and people have done things to make their engine and their engine compartment more beautiful. And so we said, well, why not do that from the factory? And so uh, we've got these very large uh, vented uh, carbon panels to close out either side uh, of the engine compartment. And then we mounted, uh, so this is additional lighting. So when you open the hatch, the lights and the luggage uh, light up, but when you get this option, you get the carbon panels plus additional lights uh, that are mounted to the underside of the hatch, so when you open up the whole engine bay, is all lit up, uh, bathed in light, and then as you approach the car and you turn, you know, you lock it or unlock it, and all the courtesy lights come on, it lights up too, and so you, as you approach your car, you can actually see the engine uh, kind of glowing in there. It's a really cool option. Um, it, it hasn't got a ton of airplay, but you can uh, go out and check it out on some of the cars uh, out here. So uh, Z51, uh, we've had Z51 for decades and decades. Um, we have it, it's a little bit different this time, uh, but it is essentially, you know, if you're gonna track your car, it's a must have option. Um, Harlan didn't mention it, when he was going through all the standard equipment, one of the things we did was make dry sump standard. And uh, you know, we've been working on dry sump for a long time. Making it standard let us mount the engine lower in the chassis. It's about an inch lower than on today's car. And so even if you get the standard car, you get the advantage of the dry sump. You get that uh, nice low engine, lower center of gravity. And because we made it standard, all engines have the dry sump, so we didn't have to do a version with and without. And so we we're able to integrate the content for the dry sump into the base engine. So instead of one scavenge pump, we have three. So a traditional one coming out of the sump under the engine, but we also have two in the heads. And you might think, well, why do I need to pump oil out of the heads? It's just gonna run back down into the sump anyway. But on a 90 degree V8, each of the banks of cylinders is sitting at an angle of 45 degrees to the ground. When you're cornering at 1G, you have a lateral force of 1G and a downward force of 1G. And the net result is a 45 degree angle. So the oil inside the engine doesn't want to flow up and it doesn't want to flow down. But when you're cornering at 1G, the body rolls a little bit and actually the engine inside the body rolls a little bit. So the engine is actually laying more than 45 degrees. So the oil doesn't go down, it runs up. So when you're cornering hard, it's actually the engine oil wants to go up into the valve covers. And that's why you have sumps on either side to take that oil out, plumb it, cool it, deaerate it, and feed it back to the engine. So the engine always has nice, cool uh, oil with no air in it. So we made that standard, uh, but there's still lots of content uh, in Z51. Uh, you get the summer performance tires. We haven't talked about the uh, all-season tires, but you do get uh, you know track-oriented summer tires. You get FE3 performance suspension, adjustable threaded spring seats. It's kind of a racy uh, thing. Somebody was asking me the other day how you uh, adjust the, the height of the car. You can put FE4 uh, magnetic ride control uh, on top of that. And this isn't just the same MR that we've had previously. This is a fourth generation. Uh, we were pioneers in this technology uh, way back when. 
Now we're on to the fourth generation, and the big deal with this is that we actually put accelerometers on the knuckle. So right out where the tires drive loads into the body, we put accelerometers on the knuckle, and that lets us read what's happening at the wheel much quicker. You take advantage of that with our new electrical architecture, which transmits messaging four times as fast, and we can really perceive what's happening out at the tire, and then we have software that can take advantage of this. It's the best riding uh, suspension we've ever had. Of course, you get bigger brakes, uh, you get extra cooling. The cooling's really cool. You got the two radiators up front that Kirk was talking about, and uh, when you get Z51, when the coolant comes back, uh, we actually cool it again. We have a heat exchanger inside the big quarter panel opening to kind of super cool the coolant, and then we use that to cool the lube for the trans and the oil for the engine, keeping all those temps uh, very low. So that comes with E51. Uh, ELSD, uh, so we've had ELSD as part of Z51 since the last generation. This time it's part of the DCT, so it's integrated into the transaxle. Since we have 60% of the weight on the rear wheels, it makes it more effective than ever. It's a huge enabler for us to do dynamic vehicle control. Um, it, it makes the car really, really benign uh, to handle. This, this car is so easy to learn how to drive at the limit. It's, it's incredible. <coughs> So Kirk talked a little bit about the, the Aero, 400 pounds of downforce at 180 miles an hour. The car actually goes faster than that, so there actually would be a little more downforce at top speed. But again, uh, this is the first time we've had a Stingray with real full vehicle downforce. Great cooling, and then uh, also includes NPP. Everybody likes NPP. Uh, it really gives you the sound quality, the tunability, the adjustability, customizability. Uh, that everybody likes. You can have it very quiet, or you can have that ground-pounding American thunder that you guys all like. <laughs> third radiator is in the quarter duct. So you see those big ducts in the back? The third one is actually, we have power fans on both sides, but you get a radiator in addition to that on Z51. And here's a picture showing the, some of those cooling paths. You can see the cool air going in. You can see the radiator. I think Kirk uh, covered most of this. Uh, but that blue air going in, that uh, goes into that heat exchanger. So this is a little complicated, but uh, I want to talk about this a little bit. It's really, uh, I was talking about how low restriction the intake is. So uh, the air going through the top of the opening, so you can kind of see it up here. This is a view kind of low looking. We've got the skin peeled off. Here's the rear brakes. You can see there's a flow path here. That's actually the air going into the engine. So if you look at it as you're looking at it from the top, here's those same blue lines. They come into the top part of that quarter opening and they actually flow through passages we created out of the body panels that need to be there anyway, the structural body panels. So there's no separate duct. Uh, it's just the, the panels that go out and support the quarter panel uh, creates a very large opening. You can stick your arm right through it. it. It's so large. It goes behind the engine, takes a turn, goes through a very large air box. The rolling chassis shows this. You can see it very clearly. We have a big kind of old school air filter, a big oval air for lots of surface area, so very low restriction. Uh, that's positioned on vehicle center line, and that feeds the throttle body on the back of the engine. So that's good in two ways. One is it reduces restriction. The other is the sound waves that are created by the engine breathing are actually transmitted back up and out that same opening, so it's just over your shoulder. Uh, at the rear of the door, and that's a very good sound. That's the kind of engine sound that you want to hear, that strong induction V8 sound. And so that's a way we actually can create a noise path intentionally back to the occupant that you can hear. Uh, steering. So we've talked a lot about steering. Part of the architecture is uh, the driving experience, less weight on the front wheels, car turns in really quickly, and we didn't talk about the fundamentals, but just sitting this much closer to the front axle shortens the steering. I mean, it almost looks like 
a ridiculous proportion, but this is the real math of today's car, where you sit and how long the steering column is, intermediate shaft, by the time you get to the rack, you're 1,600 uh, millimeters away, 1.6 meters, you can see we've shortened it substantially, much more direct uh, connection to the, to the steering gear. So that gives you the, a very stiff system, and a stiff system means that the second you move the wheel at all, you get a reaction at the front tires and the vehicle starts to move. We also have the tightest turn circle, uh, which we've ever had, because we have an even longer wheelbase than today, even wider track than today, yet the turn circle is tighter, especially if you get MR. And the reason why is that we have uh, a new invention. We use the position sensors that come with MR that tell you where the wheel is in the position relative to the body, and we have a dynamic rack stop. So typically on a rack and pinion, uh, steering, you have a mechanical stop at the end. But on this car, when you get to the end of travel, all it is is doing is back driving the motor electronically. It feels like a stop, it feels like a hard stop, but all it is is the rack not letting you turn it anymore. And that way we can adjust that stop based on conditions. So typically in vehicle design, you have to design that mechanical stop for the worst case condition, which is typically when you turn the wheel at full lock, and you drive in a steep driveway ramp and you're trying to pick the car up by that inside front tire so you push the wheel all the way up towards the body and just to make sure that that tire's not going to touch anything and you have to restrict the travel based on that but any time the wheel's any other place you could actually turn farther and it would be okay so what we're doing is using that position sensor to look at where the wheel is and in most cases we're just doing a parking lot maneuver you can actually let this the car turn more sharply. And so a, a 36 foot turn circle curve to curve for a vehicle of this size and proportion is uh, kind of unique in the world. Okay. So the front lift system, this is the one thing, when we did the reveal, it's this giant space and it was really hard to hear what the audience reaction was from up on stage because there was just this giant space. Everybody was so far away and all the sound got lost. But the one thing I did hear is all the hoorays and the applause when we said we were going to do this front lift system. So, you know, Corvettes historically, uh, they're very low cars, low center of gravity. They need uh, very low aerodynamic panels, and so it doesn't take much of a speed bump or a ramp. You can hear the air dam scraping on the bottom or rub the chin of the, the car. So uh, we've long wanted to do this, and actually uh, I'm a big defender of the transverse composite springs we've been using for years, and I know the media celebrate so celebrating getting rid of the leaf springs or not leaf springs. In fact, if we could have done transverse composite springs on this car, we would have. We couldn't because the drive line is mounted so low there's no cross car path to put it. So we're essentially forced to go to coil over shocks. But the good news is that let us put a relatively simple hydraulic lift under the, the front spring on the nose of the car that let us power that thing up about two inches. So that's another button that you hit right on the center console. And every time you hit that button, well the first time you hit it at a, at a certain location, a screen will pop up in the DIC saying, do you want to remember this? You just hit the button on the steering wheel and it remembers it forever. So every time you approach that obstacle, it'll automatically lift. So, you know, we announced you can... That's the reaction we got. So, um, you know, remembers a thousand points and you can delete them anytime if you know you're not going to be back. And then um, it's also cool, um, it works up to 24 miles an hour, and if you're coming in fast to an obstacle that you've previously remembered, it'll lift it, it'll start sooner. It'll say, oh, I'm approaching this GPS location, guy's not paying attention, he's coming in too fast. The car will say, uh-oh, we better get this nose up in the air. So it's smart enough to know when you're not paying attention. So, we announced, we announced our top speed of 194 miles an hour, uh, but we didn't put out a video. Um, so we're going to show you 
uh, a video of that run, and it's going to start right now. So this is done in Papenburg, Germany. Uh, it's a level track. It's where we've done our top speed runs for many generations of car. And unlike a lot of manufacturers who go out and just run a straight line uh, run, and whatever the top speed they see on their instrumentation is the top speed they post. That's not really the right way to do it. We have always done it the right way, which means you do a flying mile so you have to average the speed for an entire mile and you have to do it in both directions to account for wind. Because typically what you see is a pretty different speed depending on where you're, which way you're going. So here we are going up to 194. And we're not showing you both directions even though we could, but this is the first time um, in my experience, we actually got 194 in both directions. <laughs> Usually it's like three miles an hour high on one way and three miles an hour, and then you average them. Uh, and the videos we typically show show that for some reason, they were like dead calm at Papenburg this year. And so uh, it was exactly the same speed passing one way and the other. So uh, if you watch the video, it's as usual, a non-event, a couple of board development drivers cruising down the road at 194 miles an hour. It's just, you know, another day at the office. You know, the car's very easy to drive uh, at speed. It feels uh, extremely planted, and uh, that's why the video is so boring. You don't see the guy wrestling around or trying to catch the car or anything. Um, so we're very proud uh, of the stability that we have in the car. That was the standard car. So the standard car is very slick. So that's the one we use for top speed runs. The top speed of Z51 is 184. So we trade off top speed for downforce. You'll see race car top speeds are not very high. It's because they want to keep the car planted on the ground. Six gear is the top speed gear. So I didn't talk about the DCT. We take advantage of the fact that we have 60% of weight on the back to use a very low first gear ratio. So that gets the car off the line and moving. It's largely responsible for zero to 60 under three seconds. Then gears two through six are your track gears and six goes all the way up to top speed. Then as we've done historically, our top gears are tall overdrive. So seventh and eighth are great for, you know, street driving, so you quickly get up to low RPM, it's quiet, it's low mechanical stress, really good fuel economy, so we've applied that same kind of traditional Corvette philosophy to this blank sheet of paper uh, DCT. So I think we got a few minutes for questions. I'm happy to take any if you have any. Yes, right back here. Performance traction management. Is, is, is oh, PTM. If you get Z51, you get performance traction management. Period. That's like it is today. It's not. <laughs> Harlan should answer this one. <laughs> the, um, I'm sorry, the uh, magnetic ride and the performance traction management, which we call it V4, that comes together. So you have to get both together. Sorry. Sorry. We should. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm for it. Okay. I, Other I, questions? Yeah. yeah. Right here. There is rear brake cooling. Um, the, we, we had this question yesterday about uh, track belts. We don't put uh, provisions in that are explicitly designed for track work. Our lawyers simply won't let us do that. We cannot. We don't know what the aftermarket content's gonna be. We can't stand behind what they're gonna do. We can't take that liability. Uh, so we try to do the best we can to give them the best chance of providing uh, really good accommodations for our hardcore track work. Uh, but the answer is no, other than the sport seat has a, a notch in it, the way it's designed, if you look at it out there, there there's a path to get the belt a, a good um, place to come up into your lab. Next door. Uh, 
We'll be making an announcement shortly. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> Back here. Uh, you mentioned something about the electrical system being faster. Can you tell us a little bit more about the electrical system? Sure. Um, we're one of the first users of a new electrical architecture that will be used across General Motors products. Um, it is quite a bit faster, so speed of messaging uh, much faster. The big part of it is cybersecurity, so every message is encoded. Um, even though there's not been any high-profile hacks uh, of publicly, you know, vehicles, it's going to happen someday. And so uh, the fact that cars are so connected, you know, either through your cell phone or OnStar for us, uh, we have to take precautions to make sure nobody can come in and tamper with your car. So that cybersecurity is a big part of it. And then we're also adding over-the-air uh, so we can download new calibrations uh, into the car, improvements in the car. Uh, over the air, which uh, I think would be very helpful every time we introduce some new features. Customers are always saying, well, can I get that in my current car? Usually the answer is no. Uh, with over the air updating, there'll be some stuff that we can actually make backwards compatible and uh, help cars stay updated. We've got some, well, we've got more questions. Noise level, C7 versus so um, that's going to be one of the things that's going to be most surprising to people. Um, when you get in this car, you'll know in 100 yards it's a different kind of car. Um, having the rear tires so much farther rearward, and because sound pressure level, what you hear drops by the square of the distance, um, those big speakers, the big wide rear tires, are quite a bit farther away, so you actually start with less tire noise. Um, and the fact that we wanted to isolate the passenger compartment from the accessory drive, which is only about 12 inches from you, so you've got the drive belt, the tensioners, the generator, the compressor, all of those are sitting right over your shoulder. And a lot of mid-engine cars traditionally kind of sound trashy, sound of crude, kind of race car-like, and we didn't want that experience. So that's why I was talking before about plumbing the intake noise around the side of the car and up towards the door because we have a very well insulated bulkhead between the occupant compartment and the engine to take all that high frequency noise out. So this is far and away the quietest Corvette we've ever done. A lot of that road noise is taken right down. And we, we got that question a lot, both, I think there was a preconception about noise and heat and everybody said it's both quieter and cooler than the previous car which a lot of people, but we don't have the hot exhaust going through the tunnel anymore and things like that. So um, even when we were doing the, uh, the cars, when we first got in the early cars, we were like, these are way too quiet. We gotta make the exhaust louder. <laughs> so yeah, we've spent a lot of time taking the noise you don't want to hear and getting rid of that, but amping up the noise that you do want to hear. So that's fundamental to this architecture. Yes, right here. I was totally with you when we first started talking about even the original flat bottom wheel I was like wheels are meant to be round <laughs> why would you ever make a wheel that wasn't round and so um, actually what we did is when we first started talking about this squircle they call it it's kind of a square circle um, there was a lot of us that were kind of skeptical that that why do you want all those corners on the steering wheel and so we actually made we actually you just 3d printing we printed some steering wheels and put them in a current corvette and we lived with them as daily drivers to see what it was like and there's a little bit of adaption a little bit of a learning curve but it's surprising how quick you get used to it and those corners almost seem like handles. Like in typical turns, you grab a corner and you know exactly where the wheel is. And it's amazing the number of comfortable hand positions there are. If you're a three by and five person, or three and nine person, you have a full rim to grab on. If you're more a 10 and two person, you have a full rim to grab on with no, nothing in your way. So you're not grabbing in a transition where the shape is transitioning. So 
I was a big skeptic early on, and uh, I became convinced that not only was it just fine, it's going to be great. And and I that's, would say the car and um, normal driving, the steering is so quick, you can keep your hands at nine and three and anything but an extremely sharp turn just driving the car around. You know, you can do your F1 imitation. It's really actually a lot of fun. <laughs> yes, back there. Yes, uh, the bent and cracked wheels. Have you considered this in the C8? I mean, has there been some thought? Because as a daily driver, this is a concern with me. Yes, so you're talking about, the question was for people listening outside, so have we tried to do something to improve the robustness of the wheels, the road wheels? You're talking about steering wheels, now we're talking about road wheels. And the answer is yes, even though we've historically designed wheels the same way to the same loads, we have seen an increase uh, in the number of people bringing their cars in with a bent or a cracked wheel. And so yes, we increased the, the load, we came up with new testing actually, uh, and if you look at the inside rim, uh, there's actually a little more meat, so it's directionally incorrect for mass, unsprung weight, but it does make the wheel tougher and more robust. So, yes, right here. Question is, have we run the car in the Nürburgring? Yes, we have several times. We do development testing there on all our programs. Uh, everybody's interested in the fast lap. That's the last thing we do. It's never been something we've prioritized. Uh, they're also making it difficult to run fast laps, so um, we were there actually just this July to do our final tweaking and tuning. Actually, that's the top speed video that we just showed you while we were in Germany. We did that too. Um, so we did get some good data. We we're pretty happy with the car handles there, and we may publish a lap sometime. Yes. Question is, will chrome wheels come back? Well, I'll never say never, but we do not have any plans right now uh, to bring chrome wheels to come back. How many people want chrome wheels? Let's see. How pe many people don't like it that these people want chrome wheels? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. The tide is turning here. I would, I would say uh, take a look at the, uh, the car we have on display, the ceramic car, which has the uh, ultra-bright polished, um, machined aluminum, and that's, I don't know if the request is, the request is specifically for chrome, but if the request is for a bright wheel, that's our brightest wheel. And I think a lot of people like bright wheels, but we thought this is a more honest finish than the chrome plate things. And the whole industry, honestly, is working, moving away from chrome, uh, just from an environmental impact and other reasons, um, so we are too. Two more questions, two more questions. Yes, right here. Absolutely. Question is, will the 060 be released for the stock car? We, we, when we release our times, that's why we said 060 under three, we want to test a bunch of different production spec cars before we make a claim. Uh, but we're doing both FE3 and FE1, and we'll, we'll publish those numbers probably in the not too distant future. I think the thing people are going to be most surprised about is how close they are. People are going to think, oh, they're bragging about Z51, that's the fast one, the other one's going to be a lot slower. You'd be surprised how close they are. And last question, all the way back in the corner. Yes, uh, do you have, does this, is the acumen effect uh, better with this car than with the C7? Or, uh, so he's talking about acumen correction angle, so that's a chassis calibration. Most of you know it as the chatter <laughs> that you get when you're, especially at lower temperatures, when the tires have stick slip properties that are very sensitive to that. Uh, especially on Z51 and some of our up-level models. Uh, you feel that um, kind of chatter, the tires stick and slip as you go around a tight corner. That is gone. Okay, I think that's it. I'm sorry we have to cut it off. Thank you very much for coming. And enjoy the rest of your time. Make sure I stroke a check. Yeah. <laughs>